uh, I have to warn everybody, you know, so it'll be a slightly shorter uh, Sunday school, and uh, Bruce Burns is in the house, so with the, anything could happen. It'll be really short. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, we, we do have a tendency when, Rach, when, when Bruce is around that uh, we could end up off in the weeds even faster than if I just do it myself. So, <laughs> right, okay, that's right. Okay, so let me see here. I think I got everything good. Let's pray and we'll get started. Lord Jesus, again, as we open up your word and we consider what was revealed to the prophet Jeremiah and its tie-ins with the, the state of the church even today, as we are buffeted by the deceptions of the devil and those who follow after their own hearts. We ask that you would fence us in with your word, convict us of our sin, our unbelief, the different ways in which we have participated in believe these false doctrines and prophecies, and that we would bear fruit in keeping with repentance by seeking only your pure word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last time we were in the, uh, the book of Jeremiah, in fact, let me put this over on this part over here. There we go, and I probably should have the participants just right over there. I, again, I hate Zoom's free-flowing, floating windows. It would be easier if everything were connected and just like in a drawer, you hit one button, it would pop out. That alas, you know, uh, I will continue to complain to no avail. So when we last left off, we looked at the very first portion of Jeremiah chapter 23 as it related to God speaking against the, the, um, the shepherds who care only for themselves. That's, uh, that's, that's one of the things that you see in apostasy. Jude has that same uh, type of language when he talks about waterless rain clouds and uh, fruitless trees in autumn. What good, is a, what is it good as a fruit tree if it doesn't have fruit on it in autumn, right? You know, waterless wine crowds, fruitless trees, and, a, you know, and, and so the shepherds who feed only themselves. Uh, you know that you've got a problem. You, you've been used uh, improperly. Uh, in, in fact, pastors aren't supposed to use the sheep. They're supposed to serve the sheep. And so that, that's where we went with that last time. But now he's going to kind of ramp it up, talking about the false prophets. And this still applies today. What I find fascinating is that uh, in my um, public salvos given and received by Dr. Michael Brown, uh, Michael Brown refuses to believe that somehow passages like this in Ezekiel 13 and Deuteronomy 18 have any bearing on anybody who claims to be a prophet today. Uh, so, you know, the, the claim by the, uh, the, the current NAR Pentecostals and Charismatics is that um, that prophets are allowed to make errors. They are allowed to make errors, and that uh, and that in the New Testament, the New Testament prophecy is not of the same quality as Old Testament prophecy. And the reason given, specifically by Michael Brown, is he says that the uh, the survival of, an, of the nation of Israel isn't dependent upon 100% accuracy anymore. Therefore, we don't need 100% accurate prophecy. And I would note this. I have in my records, and I've talked about it on my podcast in the past, noted that Dr. Michael Brown himself has given false prophecies. Prophecies that have not come true, especially as it relates to a group of people who are believers in Israel. Um, and the prophecy that he gave was regarding somebody who had become deathly ill, and he prophesied that the person would recover from that illness, and the fellow died. And the only thing he could say is that he misheard the Lord, and, uh, and that he most likely mistook uh, his desires for the voice of God. How does one do that? How does one mistake the voice of their, their, their desires and their opinions for the voice of God? When God is talking, uh, you'll note that people normally pay very close attention and they know exactly who is talking to them. And so as kind of a primer on this, I, one of my favorite stories along these lines is the story of Balaam. You guys familiar with Balaam? All right. This, this is super helpful because one of the things we know about Balaam is that uh, he, was, uh, he was a prophet for prophet 
And Balaam was a guy who lost a lot of money as a result of God, the actual God, connecting to him and talking to him. And at no point is this man a true believer in Yahweh. In fact, the aftermath of all of this is that he did ultimately get his revenge on Yahweh and helped these people get their, um, get their curse on Israel. And we'll talk about how that happened, all right? So in Numbers chapter 22, let's take a look at that and, and you know, we'll, we'll note what's going on here. And the reason for this is to demonstrate nobody needs practice. Uh, Balaam did not have a prophetic activation from um, Patricia King, nor did he have a prophetic activation from uh, you know, any, of the, any of the people in the NAR or anything like that. He had never been to prophecy school. He did not have to sit in the lotus position and go home in order to learn how to hear the still small voice or anything like that. This guy is as wicked as they get. Three in 9, right, right. You know, so and he's the guy who's making money like his false prophets. So the people of Israel, they set out and they camped on the plains of Moab, beyond the, Jer- uh, the Jordan at Jericho. Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was in great dread of the people because they, they were many. Moab was overcome with the fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, <coughs> This horde will now lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was king of Moab, at that time sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of of the people of Ammah, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So Balaam has been summoned. He will be offered money for the purpose of cursing Israel. All right? Sounds like a real godly thing to do, right? I'm speaking facetiously, right? So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination. Are believers allowed to practice (coughs) divination? This is strictly forbidden. Deuteronomy 18 comes into play. And and you'll note, you know, so sorcery, divination, talking to the dead, fortune telling, all of this stuff is straight out. So we know from this guy's um, from his vocation, it's not even right, that's, a, that's the wrong word. We know from his job and what he's getting paid for, this guy is as wicked as they get. So they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message, and he said to them, Lodge here tonight, I'll bring back word to you as Yahweh speaks to me. And one has to wonder what's going on here. What, what's, why even put on a pretense of having a conversation with Yahweh? And it will note that uh, we, we know this from the ancient prophets, these soothsayers of the past. There was a lot of um, flim flam, a lot of theatrics. And so one has to wonder, you know, because did he really talk with different deities and stuff like this? Or did he, you know, pick up the phone and pretend to talk? You know, it's like, hey, Yahweh, yeah, this is, this is Balaam. How you doing, dude? Yeah, it's been a while since we talked, you know. You just, you just, we'll have to wonder, right? By the way, this is not a phone, it's a remote control. I shouldn't be talking to this thing. You guys are going to get me locked up for that. Okay, so the princes of Moab (coughs) stayed with Balaam, and God came to Balaam and said, so note what happens here. Um, When you hear in the prophets, and the word of Yahweh, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Isaiah, We know from John chapter 1, verse 1, Jesus is the word. So the the Dabar Elohim, or the Dabar Yahweh, the word of God, when it shows up, it doesn't show up in any mistakable form. You'll note he wasn't, you know, sitting in the lotus position trying to hear God. God came to Balaam, came right to him, and God said to him, 
Who are these men with you? That's not a safe question. All right. God's in charge here. Balaam is accountable to God. And God makes that very clear from right out of the gate. Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, has sent me, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. It covers the face of the earth. Now come curse them for me. Perhaps I'll be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people. They are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning. He said to the princes of Balaam, Go go, go to your own land, for Yahweh has refused to let me go with you. This is not normal behavior for this this divine, right? Well, he's false prophesying even there. Yeah. Because because, uh, the Lord declares the blessed status of of Mm -hmm. of, of, of Israel, and Balaam Balaam withholds the Mm -hmm. truth that the Lord gave him from the people who, if they had heeded it, might not have become toast a couple chapters later. Yeah. So it, Bruce has rightly pointed out that his explanation that he gives to Balak, uh, entourage, is that uh, he's not speaking the truth. God has basically stated the blessing, this blessed state of Israel. And by the way, this applies to all of us who are in Israel. If you are a Christian, you have been grafted into Israel. We are blessed. We are not cursed. So he doesn't give a straight answer. And, uh, and so the princes of Moab, they rose and went to Balak and said, Balak refuses to come with us. So once again, Balak sent princes more in number and more honorable than these. So Balak at this point is interpreting Balaam's behavior as he wasn't impressed with the entourage. He wasn't impressed with the amount of money and that he's engaging in a negotiation tactic. Have, have you noticed that people in the Middle East have this amazing ability to negotiate? Okay, it, it's 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 it is a sport in certain places. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, so if if you are traveling in the Middle East, I've seen this done by you know on Travel Channel and other places like this. And you find a really nice Oriental rug that you want to purchase from somebody, and they say this is a five hundred dollar rug. Don't give them the five hundred dollars. You say something to the effect of, I'll give you a hundred for it. I mean, it's, what a horrible, ugly color, and you know, you kind of talk it down. And, and then they say, a hundred dollars, you're insulting me, right? You're insulting me. I, I, I couldn't even begin to part with this for less than 450. And the negotiation's on, right? right? So they think that this is, Balak thinks that that's what's going on. He wasn't impressed with the first group, so let's, let's up the kitty a little bit here. So they came to Balaam and said, Thus is Balaam the son of Zippor, let nothing hinder you from coming to me. I will surely do for you great uh, do you great honor, and whatever you say to me, I will do. Come curse this people for me. Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balaam, Though Balaam were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of Yahweh my God to do less or to do more. And one has to wonder if he's saying this under duress. This is, uh, even the devil recognizes that Yahweh is his God. Well, he's lying. He's already, he's already denied that himself. Yeah. That's, he's posing in public like a Pharisee. Mm-hmm. Far be it from me to do anything but what the Lord commands to be more money. Yeah. He puts on pious pretenses here. But he doesn't, he's not a believer in Yahweh at all. And you can see this in the resolve of the story. So, you too, please stay here tonight. I may know what more Yahweh will say to me. So God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went to the princes of Moab. Now I'm going to note something here. Is there any evidence of any true prophet of God, a real believer in Yahweh, having to have this kind of fence put around, put around them when they give a prophecy? No, not at all. True believers, those who fear God, when given a real prophecy by God, never have to be told, do not go beyond what I say. You will do what I tell you to do, you will say what I tell you to say. Balaam is doing this against his will. He's being compelled. 
Uh, you, you'll note that his free will doesn't seem to uh, be, be, a, be along for the ride willingly. So God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of Yahweh took his stand in the way as his adversary. Yes, sir. Singular, Jesus. Oh, wait, wait. Which, which, which is the singular? The angel of the Lord. He's got the title. Uh, okay, yeah. Right. Yeah? All right. That is Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the Malach, Yahweh, yeah, the angel of Yahweh, right? Correct. The singular angel. This is Jesus standing, right? Jesus makes appearances all over the Old Testament. Gentle Jesus. Right? You can buy it. So he took a stand as his adversary. He was riding on the donkey. And two servants were with him, and the donkey saw the angel of Yahweh standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. Uh oh, well, there goes precious moments, Jesus again. Okay. <laughs> He's not even concealed carrying, man. He's, this is open carry of a, of a deadly weapon. So the donkey turned aside out of the road, went into the field. Smart donkey, <laughs> right? Nope. Nope. Bal <laughs> Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of Yahweh stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with the wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of Yahweh, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of Yahweh went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of Yahweh, she lay down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then Yahweh opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you've struck me these three times? What follows is one of the most bizarre things in all of the Bible. Okay? Because what Balaam should have done is like, Wait, when did you start talking? Okay. Okay. He, without even pausing, he answers. Balaam said to the donkey, well, because you made a fool of me, and I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. He still doesn't realize he's talking to a donkey. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all of your life to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, no. Okay, this is quite the conversation. The donkey is the smarter of the two. Yeah, mm -hmm. more faithful, too. The donkey was at least considered worthy enough to see Christ, right? So then Yahweh opened the eyes of Balaam. He saw the angel of Yahweh standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed down and fell on his face. Okay, he didn't politely go, oh, Lord, nice to see you. He, he immediately, like, uh, he's on the ground, boom, face down. He knows he's in trouble. And the angel of Yahweh said to him, why have you struck the donkey these three times? Behold, I've come out to oppose you because your way is perverse before me. Well, that, that just hurt his self-esteem. His fifis are hurt after this, right? <laughs> uh, believe me when I tell you, he's going to bear a grudge for this. He's not going to repent. And he's not going to consider the kindness of God that Christ didn't strike him down on the spot. He is, his feelings are hurt. He is going to feel like he's been outed a lot of money and honor. And he's going to get his revenge. Okay? Yeah, yes. Is this like a type of shadow of Paul's conversion? Kind of... I, I, I think that some of the uh, some of the details are similar, although we don't know if Paul was actually riding a donkey. Okay, um, m maybe not. It doesn't say. Some people say God knocked him off his high horse, and a horse is mentioned. But you'll note that there is some parallel here. the The difference is is that Paul is legitimately called to be an apostle of Christ and is brought to repentance. Uh, Balaam, no. Uh -uh. <laughs> No, no. Okay, so I'm going to point this out. One of the things that you hear in the Pentecostal movement is that Christians must perform signs and wonders. It is a necessary part of evangelism because people need to see the power of God demonstrated. And when they see the power of God demonstrated, they will realize that there's a God in heaven and they'll come to believe in Jesus. 
This is discounting God's actual example of his power, which when Moses asks to see his glory, takes him up the mountain and says, here's my glory, punishing evildoers and forgiving sinners. Yeah. You know, not, not, the, not the glory that God chooses, mm -hmm. but the special effects budget that they want. Right, exactly. I would note that the people who talk this way about signs and wonders, they're idolaters. They're idolaters of God's power. You guys remember um, Mickey Mouse and the Sorcerer's Apprentice? Mm -hmm. Okay? There's a reason why that is a classic. There's a reason why we can kind of actually resonate with the theme in that particular uh, little short that was from the Pantasia movie, the original Pantasia. There's Mickey Mouse, and he's the under, and he's not even the understudy, he's the water boy for a real wizard, right? And he steals the guy's hat and then begins to operate in his power, and everything goes bonkers. But the reason why that is happening is because they're within us. There is an idolatry. We desire to be God. That was the original temptation of the devil. When you eat of the fruit of the tree, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And we want to have that God, with God's powers. But we don't want God to be the one operating with him. We want to kind of steal him. That's kind of how Satan works in all of his evilness. And so as a result of this, you're going to note here, God himself, Jesus appeared to Balaam. Did this guy repent? Not on your life. And here's the other bit. You're going to see this in a minute. He legitimately gives a prophecy regarding Christ. In fact, that's kind of the undertone of all the actual words that God gives him to speak. It's really interesting. All right. All right. Let's see. Behold, your way is perverse before me. Donkey saw me, turned aside before me these three times. If she did not turn aside for me, surely just now I would have killed you and I would have let her live. Your donkey is holier than you are. Okay. So Balaam said to the angel of God, I've sinned. I, I did not know that you stood there in the road against me. Now, therefore, if it's evil in your sight, I will turn back. Notice he didn't ask for forgiveness. So the angel of Yahweh said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you. So Balaam went with the princes of Balaam. When Balaam heard that Balaam had come, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, on the border formed by the Arnon, at the extremity of the border. And Balaam said to Balaam, did I not send to you to call you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? Balaam said to Balaam, Behold, I have come to you. I have now, have I now any power of my own to speak anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that must I speak. And Balaam went with Balaam, and they came to Kiriath Uzzah. And Balaam sacrificed oxen and sheep and sent for Balaam and for the princes who were with him. And in the morning, Balak took Balaam and brought him up to Bamoth Baal, and from there he saw a fraction of the people. Balaam said to Balak, Build for me here seven altars, prepare for me here seven bulls, seven rams. Balak did as Balaam had said, and Balak and Balaam offered on each an altar, a bull and a ram. And Balaam said to Balak, Stand beside your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps Yahweh will come to meet me. And whatever he shows me, I will tell you. And he went to a bare height, and God met Balaam. And Balaam said to him, I have arranged the seven altars. I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. And Yahweh put a word in Balaam's mouth, and he said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. And he returned to him, and behold, he and all the princes of Moab were standing beside his burnt offering. Balaam took up his discourse, and he said, From Aram, Balak has brought me, the king of Moab, from the eastern mountains. Come curse Jacob for me, and come denounce Israel. So God, God not only gives him the word, gives it to him in the Hebraic verse. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. But how can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom Yahweh has not denounced? Far from the top of the crags, I see him. From the hills, I behold him. Who? 
<laughs> who? Who? Who's him? I'll give you one guess. It's Jesus, right? I see him. I behold him. Behold a people dwelling alone, not counting itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. And then Balak said, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemy. and Behold, you have done nothing but bless them. And he answered and said, must I not take care to speak what Yahweh puts in my mouth? <laughs> and Balaam here is saying this legitimately under duress with the edge of the sword of the angel of the Lord up against his neck. Okay? Did he give a, a true prophecy here? Yeah. And you're going to note something. This is the interesting bit. When you consider the end of Balaam, and when you consider his end, the fact that the children of Israel collected up these words. Hang on a second here. I just got kicked off. All right, so let me explain what happened. We lost internet here at the Kongs of Inger. So um, let me, there we go. All right, so I'm back, and I'm, I'm on my cell phone's hotspot because uh, we lost the internet here at Kongs of Inger. Let me share my screen, and we'll see how this rolls here. Okay, so the point I was ma making before we got so rudely interrupted by the internet crashing, is that uh, Balaam, he dies a horrible death. And the children of Israel, despite how wicked this man was, they, took, they got these words that Christ put into his mouth and they wrote them into the scriptures. The source was Yahweh. The instrument was somebody who was perverse. But the words were true, and it was a true prophecy, and it got written into, into Scripture. It's, it's, it's crazy when you think about it. But if it worked that way, then God would be able to faithfully speak through some misogynist like Paul, and women couldn't be pastors. <laughs> Did y'all hear him? <laughs> <laughs> but if it worked that way, yeah. then God would be able to speak through some terrible misogynist like St. Paul, and right. women couldn't be pastors. Yeah, I, I would invoke the Eighth Commandment in Paul's defense here. Uh, it, it, those who claim that Paul was a misogynist, they are breaking the Eighth Commandment and slandering him. But you're right, even if he was a misogynist, which he wasn't, that the Lord spoke faithfully through him. Okay, note the, the faithfulness of God is not dependent upon the faithfulness of the person he chooses to speak through. And that's kind of the point. This, this stands out because the words that Balaam spoke were put into the scripture despite the unworthiness and the perversity of the person giving the prophecy. Important for us to keep that in mind. So Balak said to him, please come with me to another place from which you may see them. You shall, you shall see only a fraction of them and you shall not see them all. Then curse them for me, uh, for me from there. You know, this kind of reminds me of uh, Dr. Seuss's green eggs and ham. You know, you know, do you like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam, I am. Would you eat them with a box, in a box? Would you eat them with a fox? Not in a box, not with a fox. I will not eat them here or there. I will not eat them anywhere, right? You know, and, and that's kind of what's going on here. He's asking, you know, well, well you, you won't curse him from there. Let's go over here. You can curse him from there. So he took him to the field of Zophim, uh, to the top of Pisgah, and built seven altars, offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Balaam said to Balak, stand here beside your burnt offering while I meet with Yahweh over there. And Yahweh met Balaam, put a word in his mouth, and said, return to Balak, and thus shall you speak. And he came to him, and behold, he was standing beside his burnt offering, and the princes of Moab with him. And Balak said to him, What has Yahweh spoken? Balaam took up his discourse. Rise, Balak, and hear, give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken? and he will not fulfill it. Now note here, 
that Yahweh is speaking directly to Balak through Balaam and letting him know who God is and what he's like. And you'll know, if you ever hear somebody say, ask the question, can God lie? Not on your life. What's the biblical proof? Oh, well, it says in Numbers, in the book of Numbers, in chapter 23, that uh, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Who was the person who spoke that prophecy? Balaam, right? And you'll know that's quoted in the New Testament. It's quoted in the New Testament by the apostles. Okay? God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Has he spoken and will not fulfill it? Behold, I received a command to bless. He has blessed. I cannot revoke it. He has not beheld misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. Yahweh their God is with them. And the shout of a king is among them. Who's that? It's Jesus again. Great messianic prophecy. Beautiful description by the shout of a king, right? So God brings them out of Egypt. It is for them. It is for them like the horns of the wild ox, for there is no enchantment against Jacob, no divination against Israel. And this applies to all who are in Christ. So when you hear somebody in the charismatic movement say, you know, we need to do some deliverance ministry over you because uh, we, need to do some, we need to break some generational curses and stuff. If you're in Christ, you are blessed. You are not cursed. Christ has broken every one of those curses. You are in Israel and you are blessed. There is no divination or sorcery that can work against Christ. All right? There is no enchantment against Jacob, no divination against Israel. Now it shall be said of Jacob and Israel, what has God wrought? Oh, salvation by grace through faith is right there, (laughs) right? Behold, a people, as a lioness, it rises up. And as a lion, it lifts itself. It does not lie down until it has devoured the prey and drunk the blood of the slain. Revelation. Yeah, (laughs) right? So Balak... Now, he's a, little, he's a little agitated at this point. <laughs> Do not curse them at all. Amen. Don't bless them at all. It's <laughs> not what I paid you for. But Balaam answered Balak, Did I not tell you all that Yahweh says that I must do? And Balak said to Balaam, Come now, I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them for me from there. So Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, which overlooks the desert. And Balaam said to Balak, build for me here seven altars, prepare for me seven bulls, seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said, offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And then when Balaam saw that it pleased Yahweh to bless Israel, he did not go as to the other times to look for omens, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. And the spirit of God came upon him And he took up his discourse. Note, the Holy Spirit now inspires Balaam to prophesy directly. And you're going to know. Watch what happens next. Balaam did not say, I feel the Lord is telling me for this season that he's going to raise up a bunch of suddenlies. And that, you know, no prophecy bingo buzzwords at all. The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of a man whose eye is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel, like palm groves that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that Yahweh has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Water shall flow from his buckets. And his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. It is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries. He shall break their bones in pieces and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down like a lion and like a lioness who will rouse him. Blessed are those who bless you and cursed are those who cursed you. Here we go again, another messianic prophecy. 
And the implication is actually quite simple. Not only is Israel blessed and cannot be cursed, but even more than that, they have one among them who is the king of kings. And nobody can conquer him. Right? And this is by virtue of the fact that, well, the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? He's in the loins of the, the successor to the messianic promise. Now Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. He struck his hands together, right? And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and behold, you've blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee to your own place. I said, I will certainly honor you, but Yahweh has held you back from honor. Those words will hit. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> okay. Now, prophets per prophet, do you think that they are happy when their bottom line is impacted negatively? No. no. And you'll see this in his actions that follow. So Balaam said to Balak, did I, tell you, uh, did I tell your messengers whom you sent to me? If Balak should give me his house full of silver and gold, I would not be able to go beyond the word of Yahweh to do either good or bad of my own. What will Yahweh, what Yahweh, what the, what Yahweh speaks, that will I speak. And now behold, I'm going to my people. Come, I will let you know what this people will do to your people in the latter days. And then he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the, of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come up out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab, break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also, his enemies, shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly. And the one from Jacob shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of cities. And then he took on, he looked on Amalek and he took up his discourse and said, Amalek was the first among the nations, but its end is utter destruction. And he looked at the Kenite and took up his discourse and said, Enduring is your dwelling place and your nest is set in the rock. Nevertheless, Cain shall be burned when Asher takes you away captive. And he took up his discourse and said, Alas, who shall live when God does this? But ships shall come from Katim and shall afflict Asher and Eber, and he too shall come to utter destruction. And I would note the ships of Katim are mentioned also in Daniel in reference to the Antichrist. It's kind of an interesting thing, a little eschatological thing there. Then Balaam rose and went back to his place, and Balak also went his way. So what happens to Balaam? Balaam immediately after this gets his revenge. And this is the incident. While Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the peoples ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel. And Yahweh said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them. Um, Bruce, was it you who described this as kind of like sexual warfare or something like to that effect? You know? So, and if you're not sure how we, how we get that, let me, let me just do a quick word search. So what happened is, is that immediately after this, Moab sent all the hot chicks into the camp of Israel, and, and they found the young, single, or even the married guys, and they went, hey there, <laughs> hey there, Mr. Israelite, mm, you know, you're looking pretty cute there, I, would you like to come over to my place, know what I mean? And uh, we can have a little barbecue for Baal, and uh, maybe you and I can do some Netflix and chill, you know? Right? That's what ball worship was. Yeah. There was, it wasn't a clothing optional church. It was a clothing not allowed church. <laughs> yeah, the worship of all clothing not allowed church. Okay, that's, uh, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. So, and, and here's the thing. Where did they learn to do this? Okay, why all of a sudden is that the case? And if you were to do a word search for Balaam in the Old Testament, let's see, I just, in fact, why don't I just do all text? There we go. All right, so let me fast forward here because 
in the later parts of Scripture, it explains where Moab got this idea from. All right, let's see here. 23. <sighs> Pass this. Okay, let's see. Scroll in. All right. So here's the end of him, by the way. All right. Balaam, is, his demise is listed in Numbers 31. Let's talk about his death real quick. You know, they killed the kings of Midian with the rest of their slain, Ive, Rechem, Zur, Hur, Reba, the five kings of Midian. They also killed Balaam, the son of Beor, with the sword. So he was killed later by the Israelites. Okay? Um, and Joshua mentions him. It also says Balaam, the son of Beor, the one who practiced divination, was killed with the sword. But we also learned that, let's see here, he was the one who taught Israel. Let's see here, forsaking. Where does it say he taught Israel to do that? I'm looking off the top of my head. That's New Testament. Is, is it really in the New Testament? Yeah, the epistles. You know, yeah, here it is. It's, it's, it's Jesus. Yeah, it's Jesus in yeah. Revelation 2. Here it is. Uh, so Christ is having a letter sent to one of the churches to the church at Pergamum, the angel of the church at Pergamum, that's your pastor, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. That's kind of appropriate. Because the sword... So the, the sword that he was holding at Paul's yeah, neck. Yeah, that's the, at Paul's neck. Right. So you're going to tell what I tell you to do. Right. right. You're going to say what I want you to say. Yeah. <laughs> you and my sword have a little conversation. Right. So Christ says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, Yet you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. There's the rest of the story. So Balaam gets his revenge, and it happens the exact next chapter. In come the weaponized hot chicks, all right, for the purpose of sexual immorality, yeah, the, the fembots. Yeah, the, the fembot army of Moab comes in, right? <laughs> What I was not expecting to be true today. Yeah. That might be a little too far. I have to work on uh, my metaphors. Okay. But they come in and they sacrifice to Baal. They have sex with these women. And a whole lot of them were killed that day. In other words, Balaam basically said, there's no way you're going to get God to curse them. You're going to have to cause them to stumble and to break his commandments. And so that's, that whole thing was his doing. But all of this to say, and this is a little bit of groundwork for the next, the next section in chapter 23. The words of the false prophets of Jeremiah's time, with just a tiny few exceptions, none of them get recorded in Scripture. The ones that do get recorded in Scripture, they get contradicted by God. And the person who gave those false prophecies, they were punished severely. And the justice that God meted out against those false prophets oftentimes was directly related to the false prophecy that they gave. One false prophet said, we will, God says we will not go into captivity. Nebuchadnezzar will turn away. God basically says to that false prophet, you're going into captivity. You're going to be led there by a hook in your nose. Yeah. Little tangent, but... Balak in this in this passage, uh, so in the Exodus, which has recently happened, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Yahweh waffle stomps his way through the up his up the Egyptian pantheon. Yep, um, and this happens again here because uh, the Baals were regional deities, and yep. he, and so they're not just random mountains; they're not just places with a view. These are the high He's places of them Baal. To the high places of specific Baalim. Right? Yeah, because it was not just a Baal. There yep. was a Baal for this hill and a Baal for this hill. You know, um, everywhere they would get a rise. They yep. would, you know, uh, and it ends with Baal Peor, who who is a thorn in Israel's foot for. Um, Almost a thousand years after this, yeah. So that's he's like the top of the of the ball of the balls in the region, 
You know, so so Balak keeps trying to level up the, the ball, which ball he can he can tap the mm-hmm. power into curse. Absolutely. And and so I think that's one reason for the uh, repetition. Yep. God's God doesn't change. He waffle stomps his way through the uh, through the Palestinian, you know, or through the Canaanite uh, pantheon too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a good point. You know, God always demonstrates that He exists and He answers prayer and He's the one who has power and these other deities, they don't even exist. Yeah. So, all right. So there, there's our little bit of legwork before we get into Jeremiah 23 the, the pro, about the false prophets uh, next week. But the idea here is, is that note that the children of Israel, despite the fact they killed Balaam, rightly so, and he's the one who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before them at Baal Peor, eating food sacrificed to idols and practicing sexual immorality, Yet Balaam's words that God gave him were collected up and put into the book of Numbers, and they are true. So consider that as we get to next week. All right. Peace, you brothers and sisters. Lord willing, we will see you next time. Hopefully our internet will be more stable next week, too. All right.